architect Divya Chakravarti. She completed her undergraduate studies from SRM University and she went on to pursue her masters in historic preservation and urbanism and study of the built environment from the University of California, Los Angeles. She went on to work for the Department of Planning and Preservation for the city of Pasadena, California. She also did a brief stint of work for Historic Scotland, Edinburgh, UK. She had also worked on conservation projects like Kalsa Mahal, Gokhale Hall in Chennai and Marimala Park Educational Trust in Mysore. She is currently working as a director of Samrakshan Heritage Consultancy. She is also a co-founder of the Artisan Reprisal of Traditional Materials. method and technology she goes on to conduct workshops to revive traditional and lost methods of construction welcome to the ugc lecture series for bachelors of architecture the subject we are dealing with is evolution of human settlements the topic we are discussing is human settlements as a political expression we shall be dealing with the planning of brasilia now if you look at the planning of brasilia which is the capital city we'll be dealing with the location population the climate the topography the culture why is it that the city was come about what was the purpose behind it the nodes the sector functions accessibility and what is the current situation that is the reality of the city brasilia if you look at uh, the context of why brasilia came about it was designed as the federal capital of brazil Brazil at one point of time underwent a huge change and they wanted a capital to reflect that change. It was the first planned city of Brazil. It has a population which is still confoundedly increasing constantly. It's the third capital of Brazil. First you have Salvador, Rio de Janeiro and now Brasilia. Brasilia is actually the largest city in the world which did not exist in the beginning of the 20th century. So this is one of the cities that did not organically develop but was strategically planned from the first point. The city was planned and developed in 1956 with Lucio Costa who was the principal urban planner and Oscar Neme who was the principal architect. So it was a joint effort between a planner and an architect which gives us a completely beautiful end result because it's not sometimes sufficient to have a well planned city the components sometimes or the individual buildings sometimes might deter from it so when you have an architect involved as well that situation slightly changes because along with a suitable mode of planning individual buildings are also suitably designed in 1960 it formally became the capital of brazil it actually resembles an airplane or that of a bird the whole idea we'll go into it is why the design came about what was the theory behind the design in spite of it being designed and only in the 20th century it has been listed as a world heritage site by unesco this is the current situation of brasilia where exactly it is situated so if you look at brasilia over here it not just being a capital you can even see rio de janeiro which is a coastal city This was planned to be a federal district that is where most government buildings would come about. So this is in the central part of Brazil. It was not as far away from the coast. You could consider it to being centrally placed. You have the Petro River and the Descoberto River in the west. So these are the two rivers that are around it. The size if you look at it it's 2245 square miles. So that's around 5814 square kilometers. In 1956 Lucia Costa he was a Brazilian urban planner he actually won the competition it was a worldwide competition that was given for a brand new city they wanted major government buildings like we have discussed it's a federal district which means it was mainly planned for the new brazil that had emerged the new government that had emerged so the architect involved in the design of the government buildings is Oscar Neme and the landscape and layout was planned by the designer Roberto Burle so the dates if you actually look at it 1956 to 1961 it was a short span of period if you look at it where for an entire city to being developed inaugurated on the 21st of april of 
1987, UNESCO declares Brasilia part of the World Heritage Site. It's kind of contrary when you look at it because UNESCO regards only heritage sites usually. This site was given a lot of importance because a brand new capital for a brand new country, that is an emerging country, was designed and developed over a short period of time and it even held a well amount of population that a growing city would entail. If you look at it, it was only planned for 50,000 inhabitants, but there was a massive population explosion happening. So currently it's nearly four times of that. So the main reason why Brasilia came about is like we just discussed, it was a brand new type of a movement they wanted to start for the 21st century. Brazil wanted to portray a new kind of face to the entire global economy. And another main reason is the old capital of Rio de Janeiro, they wanted to help that as well. If you go about seeing the climate of that place, it's a dry and humid type of climate. The average temperature is around 20 odd degrees and you have the highest maximum around 28 degrees. So not very hot place. So that kind of uh, place was considered suitable for a new capital to emerge as compared to Rio de Janeiro. So Rio de Janeiro was the capital from 1763 to 1960. It's been the most well-known capital throughout the world. But at this point of time, resources started being centered in the southern part of Brazil, the eastern region near Rio de Janeiro. But geographically, Brasilia worked better because it was more centrally located. Dating back to 1891, the capital they decided should be moved from Rio de Janeiro, which was very much towards the southern tip of the country, to a close place which is in the center of the country, so it's accessible by everybody. Plan was originally conceived in 1827. At that point of time, when Pedro I was the emperor, the plan was conceived. And the general wanted the new city of Brasilia on the idea of moving the capital westward from the heavily populated southern eastern corridor. This was not uh, seen through because Pedro I dissolved the assembly and he was no more the emperor. Because of social and political unrest, this never got through. The next important piece of history over here is when President of Brazil from 1956 to 61, he decided to order the construction of Brasilia. So Lucia Costa won a contest. So there was a major competition that was declared to come up with a main urban plan for this new city of which was going to be the face of Brazil. So the, he was a very important urban planner. There were about 5,000 odd entries for the same. Oscar Neme was a close friend who was the chief architect for most of the public buildings. And you had Brule who was the main landscape architect. So Brasilia was built in just 41 months from 1956 to April 21st, 1960. If you look at a period of time for an entire city to be constructed, it's a very short period of time. And you should see the detail that was gone into it, the kind of structures that were constructed. It was very futuristic, keeping in mind that they were stepping into the 21st century. So the culture, if you look at it, Brasilia, it was representative of many multicultural, multi-diverse. So you had Portuguese, Africans, Italians, Germans, you have certain other European countries represented there, Japanese and Armenians. So the kind of architecture which they were used to is cubist ideas, Baroque style, abstract forms, modern kind of architecture, combination of skills rather than just one. So it is a combination of many styles of architecture, ecclesial in a way. Now the reason the competition came into being was they decided they wanted the best and the best way to do that was just not choose one person but doing it in a truly democratic way as the new kind of Brazil they wanted to represent was Nova Cap which was the new capital that is new capital urbanization agency. This was headed by the architect Oscar Neme. The company was mainly to urbanize the new capital. Series of competitions between architects and urban planners. They knew right from the beginning that it was not sufficient to just have an urban planner on board. They needed an architect and series of architects and landscape designer as well for a city to have a full completion. Now, if you look at the design of, the, of Brasilia, the first place, this is Lucia Costa, based on which Brasilia stands today. 
The second place was the linear typical form that we see in most cities. And the third place was the based on the cubist kind of design. And the fourth place was the curvilinear come linear form semi radial pattern where individual sectors were going to be radial. They chose Lucia Costa for a number of reasons being it was very modernist in its expression. It had a clear thing of having a uh, you know the form of wings having the form of a bird and it was straightly laid on an axis which meant axis is a very important form of urban uh, urban component or form in urban planning so this was chosen as the best design for brasilia now if you look at the plano pilato that is this is the best kind of design that could have emerged you can see it's actually like a bird in mid air its wings wide apart you have the head and the entire body the strong axis around here and around here Lucia Costa was a modernist architect and student of Le Corbusier so a lot of his influence is seen in his design he was entirely responsible for the layout and he believed in something called an utopian city it should be an ideal city or ideal society it should be a symbol of brazilian's greatness it should lead to the development of the central region of brazil which was ignored for for so many centuries where only the southern part of brazil has always grown it should become the new center of brazil this should become the new face the new city should become the new face of the emerging country so when you actually look at the plan from above it is like a bird which open wings or even a flight in midway it could be looked at either way but it is definitely based on something that is already ready to take off which they found was very modernist very reflective of what was going to happen in the 21st century of brazil that brazil was just going to take off and be representing the global economy so what were the components his main original urban concept was a shape of a cross so that is a typical plan which you have seen right from the beginning of urban planning days in the 1700s he modified it further giving it the form of a bird so it could have the kind of dynamism which a simple cross would not have so by including an element like a bow like element it had that kinetic fluid movement to the plan which did not exist as a mere cross intended to provide brasilia with the dignity of a capital city it has two axes at right angles you have the monumental axis that is the fuselage of the plane intersecting in the center of the city with the residential axis which is the wings of the airplane to adapt this design to the local topography the natural drainage of the area one of the axis was curved in order to make it fit into an equilateral triangle so that's why you get the bow like structure in costa's notes he talks about the form he talks about the form as a very important part because two axes have always been in history but the first time he has curved one axis in order to suit the topography of the place you could either say it represents a plane or a bird in flight the local topography the natural drainage all of this was taken into consideration and given the best possible orientation free principles highway engineering that is elimination of intersections this happened because of the curved axis next the importance of the residential districts he discusses this in between the notes 3 to 5 where he gives importance to residential districts as such that is this has been placed along the curved axis civic and administrative center recreation center the municipal administration facilities the barracks the storage and supply zones small local industries railway station all along the monumental axis so over here you can see this is the back axis that is the curved portion of it is this which was the residential belt the blue belt and here you see the monumental axis in the bright red so this is pretty much like an arrow ready to get out of the bow as well so any form it took let it be a bird in flight the plane in flight an arrow which is going to get out of the bow it all suggested movement and a sense of dynamism 
banking and commercial districts fell along the intersection of the monumental and highway residential. Location of the entertainment center is along the intersection of the monument and the back axis, which is along this area. Here you have the highways, the image of that, and here the expressways. The kind of transportation that they had was within the city buses, obviously an international airport because they wanted it to be representative of the changing global economy, high speed rails. Now if you look at the zones and the sectors that were formed, like here along the curved axis in yellow you have the residential zone, blue you have the administrative zone, here in the center, bang in the center between the residential areas you have the commercial and back there in the green area is the entertainment zone. If you look at the difference in layout, you can see how the highways don't have straight intersections, but because of the curved axis, it has curved roads and the intersections never are at right angles. This actually has proven to be less accident prone. Drivers automatically become more careful because the turning radius is much wider and larger. These are the typical kind of residential areas that came about. These are the civic centers. You have the church, which is again modernist in its own way without giving way of the cathedral. It's been changed to suit the new kind of economy, the new kind of city that was emerging. Most civic buildings and open spaces. Open spaces were given a lot of importance because they wanted to stress on public congregation administrative buildings, garment buildings. They wanted to portray a kind of monumentality, create a sense of awe, different kind of architecture, modernist architecture that needed someone to explain something which was considered to be the future of architecture or urban planning. These are the commercial districts. And now we'll go into the building hierarchy. So you first had the plaza of three powers, house fundamental powers that is the equilateral triangle that we have discussed about, government and supreme court forms the base of the triangle, the congress is at very much at the apex, the church comes to the center at the given own square and the monumental axis you have the government and the municipal plaza evident. Now if you look at the landscaping like we just mentioned open spaces was given a lot of importance because they wanted to propagate a lot of interaction between the public. They wanted even some space for future expansion, say in case the population increased. So all of this kept in mind, the city was built as a large open area with a lot of open areas between the built structures. You have something called super blocks, which are surrounded by bands of greenery planted with trees, strips of districts also again planted with greenery, Park City, which is filled with open areas such as squares, flower gardens, vegetable gardens, botanical gardens, and the cemeteries were at the end of residential highway axis. Now, if you look at the vehicular circulation, you have secondary roads, which controls heavy vehicular traffic. The traffic is controlled by roads that will either go on a platform, underground, or under the platform. Clover shaped turnoffs. This was a kind of turnoff that was there where the circulation would happen in different districts without creating an intersection. So this is where the green belt would be and all the roads would go along this. So without having an intersection, the roads were created. Like we just saw, this actually happened because of the curved axis that was there. Pedestrian circulation, you had independent paths. Local pathway systems were created for each district, residential, commercial, administrative districts. This was completely separated from vehicular circulation. So they gave a lot of importance to pedestrian traffic as well as their safety. So if you look at his notes and his design notes, it is obviously airplane style, monumental axis, four scales of design. You have the monumental scale, which is symbolic, the residential scale, which is comfortable, the gregarious scale, which is the social buildings, the bucolic scale, which is the park, city, and the rustic spaces. So when you look at these different scales, it was based on the comfort level of the people. At the very same time, they wanted to portray Brasilia as a modern city of the 21st century. The dignity of a capital city. It should have an esplanade where the ministries and public buildings are located. 
the bus stations where the two axes cross, the cathedral and the plaza of the three powers. So individual super blocks when you look at it, uniform height of six stories, no high rises and vast motorways, ample parking, low population density, open green spaces for people to enjoy. These are typical super blocks. The number of super blocks that were built based on different typologies. It could be a residential super block or a ministerial super block depending on the location. It was all done based on different typologies of building at that space of time. How is Brasilia today? We can certainly say that Brasilia has changed the ways of the Brazilian architecture. Name is shown in a couple of lines the harmony and beauty that those buildings would have. And it's interesting that during all these years, the buildings have remained great and admired throughout the world. The modern use of concrete and glass gives a sensual space and shape to all of these buildings, when all of them are inspired from women's curves, which marks the typical idea of Brazilian architecture. So that was their attitude at that point of time and still is they believe in celebrating womanhood. So this is Brasilia today as compared to the late 60s. If you look at it in terms of high rises, it is uniform. There is no towering structures like you see in the skyline of New York or Chicago. All of them are sitting squat. And at that point of time, just beginning when it was inaugurated, this was how it was, a blank landscape with lots of motorways and open spaces. But now, over a period of time, the more of these squat buildings have come about, but still they have followed the rule of not having any towering buildings. So if you look at the thing, they actually followed the Athens Charter, which is a very important and remarkable thing. They differentiated housing, work, recreation and traffic. The Athens Charter was taken into it, which was never done for any brand new city. If you look at the positive aspects of the planning of Brasilia, it was supposed to be designed to represent Brazil of the 21st century, which was in 1960. So it was definitely futuristically designed. It was the first time you have an urban planner, an architect and a landscape designer get together to plan a city right at the nascent phase. It was the first time that smooth transit flow was given importance where the zoning has been done initially and five decades later still the zoning is very much in place. It is the only city that was built in the 20th century that has been awarded by the UNESCO status because UNESCO usually regards only historic cities and towns. The planning policies as such locating the residential areas around the expansion areas and making sure it's futuristic in such a way that in spite of having a population explosion, it's still very much a viable and livable city. And it does have an impression of a very modern city because of the layout, because of the individual buildings that were designed at the same time, uh, point of time. And even the new buildings that have been coming about are a reflection of that period as well. It was designed as an antidote which was not just basically an antithesis to the site or capital uh, of Brazil. It was supposed to represent the new growing global economy of Brazil. The basic units, the huge super blocks, everything was representative of how big Brazil was going to become. The same facade, the same height, the same facilities. So a kind of utopia was also being represented. The same kind of materials, glass, steel and concrete the kind of preventive uh, measures being taken as a socialist reform at the same time being a capitalist country to make sure that there is uniformity amongst all the social classes and all the families are leading the same kind of life together. So in spite of it being representative, uh, representative of a capitalist economy, it was very socialist in the way it was planned. So that's why it's considered a utopian kind of plan. If you look at the negative aspects of it, the most commonly criticized factor is the monotony in the layout of the city. All the buildings are of the same height, same material. When they wanted to create a kind of equality socially, what happened is that there was no difference in the type of building and the typology of the building. So you just have super blocks of the same height, 
large open spaces and vast roads. So it is kind of boring, it has a monotony set in, no bright colors are used. So it kind of leads the newcomer to the city, a kind of scenario where he doesn't know where he is. One part of the city resembles any other part of the city. So if you look at vibrant cities like New York and Chicago, you have something like a downtown. You have something like a place where it's commercial and residential at all, all times of the day. Versus in Brasilia, that whole feeling is lost. You have a separate commercial sector, you have a residential sector, you have an industrial sector, an entertainment sector, and the administrative sector. So all of these sectors have been stringently demarcated and followed till date, which means there is a part of the city that completely sleeps off at night because there is no government activity and no kind of commercial activity happening during the night. At the same time, there is a part of the city that is completely dull throughout the day, which is the residential sector, where people go out to work and things like that. And the residential sector becomes kind of dull throughout the day. So it, it does not have a balance which was required by most cities and which follows the trend of having 24 hour cities in today's context. So at the end of this, we have clearly studied the planning of Brasilia, the kind of city it was supposed to be and the kind of city it is after five decades. We should be able to answer the following questions at the end of this. Discuss the location and purpose behind the city of Brasilia. What was the concept behind the design of the city of Brasilia? Discuss the building hierarchy in the design of the city of Brasilia. And discuss the steps taken by Costa towards the circulation within the city. That brings us to the end of this lecture. Thank you.